Welcome everybody to our best practices for pediatric orthopedics. This session is going to focus on lower extremity trauma and sports injuries. Um, thanks so much for uh, coming to join us uh, virtually as it is uh, this evening. Um, I want to thank Christina Coleman for organizing this and administratively making it happen uh, for us. We're going to have a terrific review of primary care pediatric orthopedics. Um, and it's really going to be, uh, I think, very relevant to pediatricians and therapists and others in the audience um, uh, who take care of uh, children with orthopedic problems. I'm also very pleased that uh, we have a terrific panel uh, with us that is representative of four of the greater New York uh, City counties. Uh, we have Lana Nierenstein, who's um, with NYP Queens, and Sam Vanderveld, who is with NYP Methodist, as well as Kristen Russo with NYP Methodist. Um, Katie Rosenwasser is based in Westchester County, as well as uh, at Children's Hospital of New York. And Lauren Redler is at Children's Hospital of New York and Lower Manhattan. And then myself at, uh, up at Children's Hospital. So um, that's the panel and this, I've told you the topics. We look forward to talking with you after each talk. There'll be an opportunity for questions and answers. If you would use the Q&A function um, on the screen and we will do our very best to address all of the questions. Um, we've got roughly two hours um, to uh, get through the material. I think that we'll have more than enough time to do so comfortably. Lastly, expect a um, survey tomorrow morning in your email. And as part of that information will be um, how, to, how to obtain a, a CME credit uh, for the event. So with that, I'm gonna turn this now back to Dr. Rosenwasser to get us started. Thanks, Katie. Thanks so much, Dr. Hyman, and welcome everybody. Thanks for participating in our webinar this evening. I would like to introduce our first speaker, who's Dr. Sam Vandeveld. As Dr. Hyman mentioned, he's based in Brooklyn out of NYP Methodist, and he will be giving us a review of hip pathologies as well as hip preservation in the pediatric patient. So Sam, you can go ahead and share your screen and thanks so much for taking part. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Katie. Um, so I'll be, as uh, Katie discussed, uh, talking about hip preservation in the children and the young adults. Um, I don't have any disclosures that are pertinent to this um, presentation. So let, let's first sort of briefly discuss what is hip preservation. So uh, traditionally, uh, hip pathology has been divided between uh, pediatric orthopedic surgeons and the uh, other spectrum, which is the arthroplasty uh, surgeons. And so hip preservation basically creates a bridge between these two uh, practices and covers the entire spectrum of uh, hip pathology. Um, our uh, treatments include um, it can range from, from observation, bracing, casting, uh, hip arthroscopy, the various uh, osteotomies all the way to um, uh, total hip replacement. Um, I'd like to discuss the uh, four usual suspects that we are uh, often confronted with, both in primary practice as well as in the specialized hip uh, preservation clinic. The biggest one is uh, hip dysplasia. Um, hip dysplasia is very common. One in 100 uh, children has some degree of hip dysplasia. Uh, frank dislocation occurs in one out of a thousand uh, uh, newborns. And, and as discussed, it can range from uh, very mild uh, underdevelopment of the acetabulum all the way to a, a complete dislocation of the, uh, of the femoral head. Uh, it is thought that an increased laxity, um, intrauterine, uh, causes instability, leading to an abnormal development of the acetabulum. Um, factors to consider uh, is the uh, left hip. Uh, female patients are more at risk. The uh, firstborn, given that the uh, first time the uterus is um, carrying a child, there is less uh, uh, room for the uh, hip to develop. Uh, breech uh, babies, uh, any patient with a family history, as well as um, oligohydramnios. Hang on a second here. So uh, once you have a child that comes in for screening, um, we have to make a distinction between the, the very young baby and the slightly older child. In, in, in babies, uh, 
um, uh, dysplastic hip will present itself with limited abduction. And then the classic test that we perform, uh, which is the Barlow, uh, trying to dislocate an uh, unlocated hip, an Ortolani uh, maneuver where you reduce the hip, as well as Cagliazzi, where you will see a leg length uh, difference. At the young age, ultrasound is the um, uh, preferred method of, um, uh, uh, of uh, diagnosis. So once the child is uh, slightly older, none of the uh, Barlow and Ortolani uh, maneuvers will be very efficient. So uh, then you're uh, left with uh, limited adduction in a Galeazzi sign. In the uh, older child, uh, we stop using ultrasounds and switch over to uh, pelvic x-rays. The adolescent, on the other hand, will uh, present with an entirely different um, spectrum of complaints. Um, so the primary um, driving uh, reason to visit you in the office will be some sort of instability pain, pain during daily activities, walking, which is distinct from the uh, impingement pain, which we'll uh, later discuss, uh, which is more uh, flexion-based uh, pain in the groin. Uh, in addition, uh, carefully um, check for the abductor strengths because one of the early signs of, um, of um, hip dysplasia in adolescence will be in Trendelenburg. Um, the mainstay of um, diagnosis in the older uh, child and young adult remains an x-ray. Uh, all the additional imaging such as CTs and MRI scans um, are um, of a relative minor uh, additional value. When we talk about treatment in dysplasia, um, first and foremost, screening is the absolute most important thing. The earlier you can detect hip dysplasia, the uh, less invasive the treatment will be. So any child uh, born breech, any uh, family history of hip dysplasia, any abnormal exam um, should um, warrant any further investigation. Um, in very mild cases, sometimes just reassurance is, is sufficient. Um, observation is uh, often required specifically in the breech patients. So uh, I will routinely repeat the x-ray at six months, even if the initial examination is normal in uh, patients born with breech. Um, the uh, initial treatment in young children uh, will be pavlic harness uh, up to rigid braces. Uh, once we get a little older, and the initial treatment doesn't work, we'll have to move on to uh, closed open reductions uh, and eventually uh, a whole variety of osteotomies are available to uh, reduce the hip. In the adolescent or adult hip with uh, symptomatic hip dysplasia, um, we are left with basically two primary treatment options. One is the periacetal or osteotomy. Uh, where the entire uh, acetabulum can be reoriented to optimize the loading within the joint. Uh, this can be combined with a variety of uh, other treatments to restore the normal anatomy. Uh, but once the symptomatic hip dysplasia patient um, has um, cartilage degeneration that's too advanced, um, the best option will then be a total hip replacement. The uh, second usual suspect is uh, the impingement uh, complaints. Uh, impingement is very common. Um, the actual deformity is present in a large percentage of the population. Most of them are actually asymptomatic. Uh, it will become apparent in those patients who uh, look for the extremes of their uh, hip motions, such as uh, ballerinas, people involved in martial arts, uh, gymnastics. Uh, traditionally, uh, impingement is divided in a cam and a pincer. A uh, cam is your um, football slash soccer player with a uh, high um, neck, uh, reduced, sorry, head neck offset deformity. Um, the pincer is a broader term which is, involves a global retroversion of the acetabulum, can be uh, coxa profunda all the way to protrusion acetabuli. Um, in reality, uh, most of the time we're dealing with a mixed uh, type. The impingement uh, the patient will be older in general than your uh, dysplasia uh, patient and present with uh, traditional pain in the groin with flexion. Uh, on physical examination, the uh, flexion will be markedly reduced uh, as well as internal rotation, uh, resulting in positive impingement tests. Uh, again, um, the first line of um, uh, 
uh, imaging will be your X-ray and AP pelvis, mostly to um, exclude any possible underlying uh, hip dysplasia. And then uh, done at 45 degrees, which is a lateral view, which is the most sensitive to detect any kind of cam deformity. Um, most people actually will do um, very well with just non-operative uh, care, uh, which is a combination of manual therapy, injections, uh, physical therapy. However, if the uh, patient hits a wall and uh, there's no improvement in symptoms, uh, after a dedicated non-operative uh, treatment of approximately three months, uh, surgical uh, treatment can be discussed. Uh, the standard uh, today will be, in most cases, a hip arthroscopy, which is um, um, uh, performed to um, um, restore the suction seal of the uh, labrum uh, by either repairing it or reconstructing it, uh, as well as uh, removing the uh, cam deformity. In some cases, for example, in a posterior cam um, or in a, a retroverted um, acetabulum, um, hip arthroscopy is not your preferred treatment. And so then it can either be done by surgical hip dislocation or osteotomies. The uh, third um, uh, classic um, pediatric hip um, pathology that, that definitely needs to be on the radar is uh, Perthes disease. Uh, Perthes disease is not as common as the um, hip dysplasia or uh, impingement. However, the importance of recognizing it early is uh, important, particularly in the uh, uh, primary care setting, since early uh, recognition as well as uh, treatment can um, uh, possibly prevent the need for extensive uh, future surgery. So uh, Perthes is a uh, avascular necrosis of the uh, capital uh, femoral epiphysis. It happens usually between uh, the ages of four and ten, and these patients present with gradual increase in pain. Um, there are four stages, um, going from synovitis up to fragmentation, then the um, epiphysis will reossify and eventually remodel. The initial treatment when a child presents with birthies will usually be uh, some form of uh, reduced weight-bearing, uh, if necessary, even uh, a wheelchair will be uh, necessary, uh, as well as uh, soft tissue releases to uh, prevent adduction contractures. Children, um, as some people say, are, are almost like lizards. They, they can um, uh, heal very well. Uh, you will never see remodeling like this in an adult uh, patient. Uh, the prognosis uh, will be better if the child is younger and if less and 50% of the uh, femoral head is involved. Um, despite these um, uh, various classifications, it's still somewhat hard to predict who will do well and who will actually end up needing uh, salvage surgery. Uh, so if a child continues to um, um, have a, a further um, abnormal remodeling of the femoral head with subsequent acetabular um, um, abnormal formation, uh, salvage procedures such as described here uh, will be necessary. Uh, finally, the, the fourth and final one um, of the four suspects is the skiffy. Uh, skiffy is a um, hip pathology which is uh, typically seen in the slightly obese uh, boy or in the younger child with some kind of um, uh, thyroid growth hormone uh, issue. Uh, it uh, can present itself as a um, acute onset of pain, or it can uh, uh, be very sneaky and be a chronic um, insidious uh, cause of, of hip pain, often presenting as, uh, as knee pain. Um, I've, I've seen children treated by, by a physical therapist for, for about six months uh, before the actual uh, culprit, which was a skiffy, uh, was discovered. Um, it is, it's, it's common, it's uh, 10 in, um, uh, per 100,000 uh, patients per year. The uh, big issue with Skiffy is that if we detect it early and if we um, treat the uh, stable Skiffy, which is a patient who can actually put uh, weight on the affected limb, if we uh, can stabilize that the outcome is, is, is excellent, 
However, in the unstable SCIFI, and uh, the, especially the severe acute and chronic uh, deformity, the outcomes are, are a lot worse with um, a risk of uh, necrosis of the femoral head, uh, as well as uh, deformity leading to uh, early onset osteoarthritis. Uh, treatment of a um, stable SCIFI, uh, which, which is a mild in deformity, uh, can just be done with a simple uh, uh, fixation with a uh, screw. Um, in the acute setting, a uh, SCIFI can also be gently uh, reduced and then uh, fixed with a screw. However, once we uh, start going into the severe, severe deformities, uh, often a um, uh, surgical hip dislocation will be required uh, to optimize the survival of the, the hip joint. Um, that was it. Thank you. Sam, ter terrific. That's a, a wonderful uh, uh, talk, uh, 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 comprehensive talk on uh, pediatric hip uh, pathologies. Um, just a, a couple of questions. Um, with respect to hip dysplasia, is there any value um, early on to double diapering? That people have often recommended that. Um, what's, what's your experience, your thoughts? Um, no, so, so I, I believe in the, um, um, in either careful observation, as in um, not stressing the family out with uh, treatments that are not proven to be efficient, um, and just careful follow up in the mild cases, especially in the young ones. But then once the treatment is indicated, um, I would go for the uh, scientifically proven, safest, best, most reliable treatment, which is a pavlic harness. Sure. Um, I know that a lot of pediatricians will see newborns that are very chubby and they'll often have asymmetric thigh folds. How indicative of that, how prognostic is that of um, actual hip pathology? Um, it, is, it is not, but any, to be honest, any um, concern. Um, so that the thought behind the, the abnormal faults is that one femur is, is functionally shorter than the other, creating an additional fold. Um, any reason for concern um, is, is, is a good reason to, to be further evaluated uh, in, with an ultrasound. Okay, terrific. And then we have a question from the audience, um, I presume from an athletic trainer. Are there any concerns that an athletic trainer should have for young athletes with any of these conditions? So, so um, yes, with, so, so one, because so one of the questions sometimes is once someone has, because um, I'm, so there, let's, let's put it this way, with Skiffy, it's a surgical indication. So I'm going to take this one off the table. Hip dysplasia is a, um, uh, there's a lot of room for improvement to maintain the normal strength around the hip joint core exercises, walking, um, uh, balance, where athletic training is, is, is highly valuable. The biggest um, population for athletic trainers will be the patients with uh, impingement. As mentioned in my talk, um, the majority of, 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 of the population has some kind of cam deformity, uh, but not all of these uh, patients present with symptoms. Often um, reducing the intensity of the high flexion activities, um, uh, some core training uh, manipulations will decrease the uh, inflammation and reduce the symptoms and the patient can return back to uh, any kind of physical activity uh, without the need for surgery. Right. I think that's a good answer. The only thing I would add is that I think that it's important to stress that none of these conditions are emergencies other than a slipped capital femoral epiphysis, a skiffy. So if you're an athletic trainer and you have a child who has the who has the proper age and body habitus where you, where you might suspect that they have a slip, which would be a peri-adolescent, uh, 12, 13 year old who is somewhat obese um, and they're complaining of either hip pain or knee pain. That's someone that you may wanna to suggest to be seen by their pediatrician and, and be evaluated um, rather than get them back onto the field.
um, to play. If you continue to play with um, perthes or uh, FAI or, or hip dysplasia, no harm, no foul, but you really don't want to push somebody with a slip. Except I would like to, that actually I entirely agree. Um, my one um, concern with an athlete who is um, like 16, 18 years old and presents with groin pain or kind of instability pain during walking, running is that um, some form of analysis is indicated to make sure there is no underlying dysplasia because once the cartilage is too far gone, you lose that window for hip preservation. And um, the next final treatment then will be your total hip replacement, which no young person is waiting for. Agreed, agreed. I was really talking about the young adolescent. But in any event, um, there's a question about hip replacement. And that is, if a hip replacement is necessary at a young age, what is the usual lifespan of that hip replacement? So. Um, I will be frank with you, no one really knows. Um, the um, current hip replacements are projected to um, last 20, 25 years in 90% in of the uh, patients. Um, however, the population, uh, the younger population, of course, has higher demands on the hip. So we don't really know yet, but at the same time, a total hip replacement in a young patient is performed not in someone who is desiring to go back to martial arts. It will be performed in someone who desires to um, uh, get out of the wheelchair and um, uh, be able to just walk to school again without pain. Agreed. Listen, thanks very much, Sam. Terrific talk and great uh, answers to the questions. I now would like to introduce our next speaker, who is um, <clears throat> my co-director for the course, Dr. Katie Rosenwasser. She's going to talk about uh, knee issues in children. Katie uh, trained with us at Columbia for her orthopedic residency, then went on to my alma mater at uh, Hospital for Sick Children for a pediatric orthopedics fellowship, followed by an additional fellowship in uh, limb deformity reconstruction. So we're very, very happy to have uh, Katie join us uh, back at Columbia. Katie, all yours. Thanks so much, Dr. Hyman. And uh, yes, I'll be talking about angular deformities as well as torsional differences and limb length differences in young children. So we will first discover the most common angular deformities about the knee, which are bowed legs or genu varum, as well as knocked knees or genu valgum. We will then review common rotational differences about the lower extremity, including femoral antiversion and uh, internal tibial torsion. And then we will briefly discuss limb length difference in the young child. So just as a review, um, the normal limb alignment refers to the collinearity of the hip, the knee, and the ankle, and the joint orientation refers to the position of e each joint relative to the axis of the limb segment uh, that surrounds it. So here we see a picture, a sort of cartoon picture of a lower extremity, and whenever we discuss alignment, we refer to a line from the center of the hip down to the center of the ankle and where that passes within the knee. So when we look at the mechanical axis of a limb, as I just mentioned, that straight line from center of hip to center of ankle, we hope that this will come through the center of the knee or really just medial to the center of the knee by a couple of millimeters. When we're talking about pathology surrounding alignment about the knee, we have a certain number of normal angles that we use when anal analyzing these types of x-rays. When we look for malalignment, with the most common about the knee being varus and valgus, we use that line from the center of the hip to the center of the knee and see where that line passes in relation to the center of the knee. If that line passes to the lateral aspect, that indicates valgus about the knee. And if it passes medial to it, it indicates varus about the knee. So we'll first talk about some physiologic lower extremity changes. Genu varum is a normal physiologic process in children. It's normal in children under the age of two with the maximal varus that we see being at about age six to 12 months. The knees then migrate to neutral between 18 to 24 months. 
We'll get a little bit more into genu valgum thereafter, but that tends to happen at a little bit of an older age, around three, with maximum valgus at about age four, and then a migration back to physiologic valgus a few years later. When we're looking at genu varum, your differential diagnosis should, number one, include physiologic genu varum. So it's important to take into account the age of your patient. Seeing a young child under age two with bowed legs is considered normal. However, once they become over the age of two, other pathologies should come to mind. These include Blount's disease or infantile tibia vera. You should be considering physeal differences secondary to trauma or infection, metabolic bone disease, including vitamin D resistant rickets and renal osteodystrophy, as well as skeletal dysplasias, including multiple epiphyseal dysplasia, spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia, achondroplasia, and others. So if you meet a child over the age of two with genu varum or a kid over two with progression of genu varum, different considerations should can be uh, taken in the general pediatric office or as seen by a physical therapist. This could include a metabolic bone workup, including looking at calcium phosphate, ALKFOS, PTH, and vitamin D. And then imaging really comes into play when you have clinically significant bowing over the age of two. If there are other signs of skeletal dysplasia within the patient or risk factors for Blount's disease, including obesity, early walking, or African-American uh, background, this should bring to mind a possible diagnosis of Blount's. We won't in this talk get into the specific radiographic parameters for Blount's, but these would be things that should um, prompt perhaps an earlier referral to orthopedics. Additionally, if there's a known history of infection or trauma affecting the knee and progressive genu varum, this also could prompt referral. When talking about knock knees or genu valgum, this again is a normal physiologic process in children. We expect less than 15 degrees of valgus in children under seven. It's considered pathologic when valgus knees progress after the age of seven. A differential diagnosis could include again, skeletal dysplasias, physeal trauma or infection, tumors, including fibrous dysplasia, osteochondromas or Ollier's disease, or metabolic bone issues, or may be just considered idiopathic genu valgum that happens to be worsening beyond age seven. So again, when you meet a kid with knock knees and there seems to be progressing, you can consider a metabolic bone workup with the similar labs that we discussed for genu varum. And, and usually uh, defer imaging until you see a progressive valgus more than 15 degrees in a child of older seven if there's no other signs in the history or physical exam of an ongoing skeletal dysplasia or a history of infection or trauma. For these two uh, pathologies, our, our go-to method of fixation is something called guided growth, where we utilize the fact that there's growth potential in these young children and apply a tether to whichever side of the physis is outgrowing the other. So in the case of genu valgum, with the medial side of the physis outgrowing the lateral, we apply a tension band in, in the form of a plate and screws that will temporarily pause growth on that part of the physis and allow the opposite side to catch up. This allows the limb to be straightened over time in a child that has growth remaining. So these are the types of kids to refer to us and they have a relatively simple and relatively low morbidity procedure that can give kids neutral mechanical alignment by the time they're skeletal immature. Next, we'll discuss some rotational differences in the, in the lower extremity in children. The first being femoral antiversion. This is a common congenital condition caused by intrauterine, intrauterine positioning. It's often seen in early childhood and can occur in girls more than boys and is often seen to be bilateral. The pathology that exists is an increased antiversion of the femoral neck relative to the femur itself. At birth, this is normally between 30 and 40 degrees and decreases to the adult number of 15 degrees by skeletal maturity. When you meet children who have increased femoral antiversion, it's important to discuss that the natural history is resolution by age 10 to 12. On physical exam, these may be your W sitting kids, 
kids who are walking with their uh, with an in-towing type gait and you see that the kneecaps are pointing in. On their prone exam, you might notice an internal rotation of over 70 degrees with the normal range being 20 to 60 degrees and a commensurately less external rotation of less than 20 degrees with the normal being between 30 and 60 degrees. The second cause of intoing or a common uh, torsional difference that we see in young children is internal tibial torsion. This is the most common cause of intoing in toddlers. It is also thought to be the result of intrauterine positioning. We typically see internal torsion in children between ages one and three, and again, it is often seen to be bilateral. The important take home here, similar to femoral antiversion, is that the natural history is resolution, although from a, by a slightly younger age, by age four to six. We also always discuss with families that bracing and orthotics do not affect the natural history of internal torsion and that it will naturally improve as the child gets older. On physical exam, you'll see an internal foot progression angle or an in-towing gait, as well as the thigh foot angle, which is the angle pretended when the prone position between the foot and the thigh, with a mean in infants being at about five degrees with a range of minus 30 to plus 20 degrees, which will increase up to a mean at age eight of 10 degrees external. It, it is not considered pathologic until you have more than 10 degrees of internal uh, five foot angle. You can also look to the transmalleolar axis on the physical exam with a mean in infants of zero to minus 10 degrees and a mean by age eight, again, of 15 degrees external with more than 15 degrees of internal rotation being considered pathologic. For both femoral antiversion and internal tibial torsion, the solution is surgical. And so when we meet children at a young age with these issues, we reassure that most of the time, the natural history is resolution, but if it is not done, then the, the surgical option is a derotational osteotomy and that we do not recommend physical therapy or bracing for either of these conditions. Lastly, I want to talk briefly about limb length difference in the growing child. A limb length discrepancy exists in about two thirds of the population, and it is considered normal up to one and a half centimeters of difference between the lower extremities. The etiologies are many, including congenital femoral deficiency, fibular hemimelia, hemihypertrophy syndromes, DDH, or a unilateral clubfoot, or acquired conditions, including a post traumatic limb length difference, a post-infectious one, secondary to a tumor, or an apparent difference that might be secondary to a soft tissue problem. The growth assumptions that we use when discussing limb length difference in the growing child are that girls tend to grow to an average of 14 years in the legs, boys to average of 16 years, and there's variable contributions to limb length from the various physis. So depending on which physis you're discussing, you can help calculate out predictions regarding limb length difference. On physical exam, you may notice a vaulting gait, a tilted pelvis with a patient standing flat on the floor. It is sometimes helpful to utilize block testing in order to level the pelvis and make estimations about limb length difference. It's always important to check for hip knee and ankle contractures that might be contributing to an apparent limb length difference. And then as Sam discussed in his hip talk, the Galeazzi test can show femoral differences and the reverse Galeazzi test, which is in the prone position, can help show tibial differences. We utilize a three joint standing x-ray with a marker ball or a ruler for calibration, as well as a bone age x-ray to help determine whether skeletal age is commensurate with chronologic age when doing calculations about limb length difference. The take home points for my lower extremity talk is that most commonly seen variations in lower extremity are normal. The natural history of most findings we see in young children is resolution and bracing and physical therapy are not indicated in most of these cases. So considering referral for genuvarum over age two or with risk factors for skeletal dysplasias or Blount's disease, in genuvalgum over age seven, that is progressive in torsional differences over age 10 that are interfering with function where we might wish to discuss possible surgical interventions and with limb length differences that are affecting gait so that we can discuss various options for addressing these by the end of skeletal maturity. Thank you.
Katie, that's a wonderful review. Thanks to very much. Um, as we're waiting for some uh, questions to come in from the audience, I, I wanted to ask you about something that is, um, I think, a, a common concern and of interest to a, a lot of people, um, and that is W sitting. Um, is there any reason to recommend against W sitting? Um, is it something that parents should fight and struggle with their children about, or are they better off just leaving it be and uh, reassuring them that it'll get better? Does it cause any problems? Thanks for the question. Yes, this is a, com a common uh, concern for many patients, for many parents, and sometimes even school teachers will make comments about it. And what I always like to do is reassure these families that kids sit in the W position because of the physical shape of their bone, and it is the way in which their hips are most comfortable. Conversely, having these kids try to sit in a cross-legged position might be uncomfortable for them. And so because we know that as they go through their physiologic lower extremity development, we expect this antiversion to remodel and approach the adult levels. We basically encourage kids to sit in the way that they're comfortable and live their life the way that they're comfortable and reassure parents that they will go through their natural improvements in antiversion as they get older. Terrific. Um, there's a question about getting a handout. We can um, get those to you uh, over the next couple of days. Um, there is also a question about recommendations for bracing for metatarsus adductus in infants or toddlers. I'll address that in my talk. Um, and then there's a question, how long would you wait for resolution until deciding on a surgical procedure? Is there an upper limit of age as well? I guess, is there a window within which it's best to do a surgery to either correct a uh, coronal plane, a, a bowing um, problem, a rotational torsional problem, or a limb length difference? So that's a great question, and I'll sort of address these each in turn. In terms of angular deformity, once a diagnosis is made, say of Blount's disease, that is one whose natural history is to worsen and become a more significant problem as the child gets older. So that is a diagnosis in which an earlier intervention, either in the form of guided growth or an osteotomy might be indicated. In the case of genuvalgum, which, te which tends not to become even considered pathologic until the patient is a little bit older, the window for guided growth is up until skeletal maturity. And so if a child with genuvalgum that is progressive is noted around age eight, then guided growth would be indicated pretty much at the patient's con and family's convenience, understanding that there would be plenty of time to make a, an adequate correction by the time the growth plates close. That said, as a child approaches skeletal maturity, your timing windows become narrower. Similarly, with limb length difference, it depends entirely on how much difference you need to make up and in which ways you're attending to address it. If a child is still skeletally immature and has a large limb length difference, this may force your hand to do an earlier set of interventions to make sure you have enough time during growth to achieve limb length equality before skeletal maturity. If a patient has a large difference and is instead considering limb lengthening, we would in fact wait until skeletal maturity to do it. So it's a little bit nuanced depending on the specific parameters. In terms of torsional differences, I tend to reassure patients that and parents that I would like the patient to reach an, a little bit of an older age for femoral antiversion, certainly up until age 12, and for tibial torsion, a little bit younger, but dependent entirely on what functional issues they are having. If a young child is worried about tripping and falling, that's the type of thing that I anticipate improving just as walking and gait become more mature. So there's a large window for surgical intervention that will still be effective. And in fact, I'll still do femoral derotation osteotomies in adults, and, and they do very well from that as well. Yeah, that's a, a great answer. I think that the, the, the main point is that if you're going to try and finesse the dis, uh, correcting the discrepancy with guided growth, that clearly has to be done while the child has growth left. If, however, uh, you're thinking about limb lengthening, maybe you can wait until they're done growing, but it's very important to recognize you don't have to. You can lengthen the limb while the child is still growing. Yes. Uh, another question, one more question um, about uh, limb length discrepancy, and that is, 
when do you recommend a lift? At what magnitude of discrepancy would you recommend a lift and at what age? So that's a great question. I tend to start recommending a lift with a limb length difference of about two centimeters. For less than that, it's often unnoticed by the patient or parent. But the other important consideration for me is whether or not I see any changes in their gait as a result of limb length difference. If I see any, any vaulting, any tilting of the pelvis, or, um, or worse yet, any equinus contracture of the ankle because of walking up on the toe in an attempt to mitigate those first two things, then I insist on a lift at an earlier time. And certainly once you get in discrepancies that are more than two centimeters, a lift is very helpful. Additionally, I call it, and I was taught by my mentor to say it's try it before you buy it with a lift. So if a patient is considering limb lengthening or guided growth to achieve limb equality, it's a nice way for them to live in the world and understand what their legs will feel like once they're equal and make sure that they're satisfied with that result before proceeding with surgery. Great, great. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. I so think that- I think you're up next. Okay. So our next uh, speaker is Dr. Joshua Hyman, who has uh, been with our department and is um, an expert in all things lower extremity, taking care of pathologies about the hip, knee, and the foot. And today he will be he will be discussing common pediatric foot problems and non-problems, and when it is time to refer. So thank you very much, Dr. Hyman. Thank you, Katie. So let's get started. Um, so the first thing, of course, to recognize is that congenital and acquired foot problems are very common. And of course, you all will see this in your practice. Um, we define flexible deformities as those that can be passively correctable. That is, you put the foot in your hand and it looks a little bit bent or twisted and you can very easily uh, unbend it, untwist it and make it look like a regular foot. Rigid form deformities are those that don't correct um, uh, with, uh, without treatment. And the primary difference between flexible and rigid is that flexible deformities will tend to improve on their own, regardless of what we do. Whereas rigid deformities in general do require some form of treatment, either manipulative treatment um, and casting or sometimes surgery. Uh, we like to get most of this done um, prior to walking so that we don't inter interfere with um, uh, the child's development or really more accurately with the anxiety uh, of the parents around children's obtaining uh, their uh, uh, milestones and their development. It really is not um, uh, terribly difficult. Um, uh, it's not a terrible uh, uh, hardship for a child to have a, a delay in their walking um, by a few months. Uh, so in that sense, early recognition uh, and uh, referral is important so that we can get these issues um, addressed at a uh, younger age. The common disorders can be lumped um, into a couple of, into a few categories. There are the postural deformities. Um, these are the ones that I discussed that are, that are uh, fairly uh, uh, flexible. Um, metatarsus adductus, calcaneo valgus foot, and flexible flat foot. The structural or rigid deformities, club foot, congenital vertical talus, and tarsal coalition. And then the osteochondrosis, Kohler's disease, Freiburg's infraction, Seaver's disease, or heel pain. And then, of course, toe, toe deformities, which primarily are either too many toes or toes that are stuck together. For the purpose of this talk, we're going to focus just on metatarsus adductus, calcaneo valgus foot, flexible flat foot, and club foot. Metatarsus adductus, um, I think you all uh, have seen, uh, it's a foot that looks more like a bean. Um, it has a curvature to it, and it's um, a very common cause of uh, in-towing in infants and um, children. The important thing to recognize is that it is not a club foot. Uh, it is purely just adductus of the forefoot. There's no equinus, there's no cavus of the midfoot, and there's no varus of the hindfoot. Um, it's just this little bend to the foot. Uh, we are not entirely sure what the cause is, but we believe it has something to do with intrauterine compression. Um, we like to call these packaging disorders. The, uh, as I mentioned, it's fairly common, seen in about one to 3% of all births. Typically it's bilateral, 
and it's associated with other packaging disorders. Um, for instance, hip dysplasia and torticollis. So it's really important for these kids that you perform a careful hip exam. As you know, it is critical that you examine the hips at every well baby visit um, throughout the first year of life. Um, but I would argue pay close attention um, if a child comes in with a foot deformity. The classification is based on flexibility. Um, we call the foot actively correctable, and the vast majority of these are actively correctable. If you can just stroke the lateral border, stimulate the child's foot a little bit, tickle them, and their toes splay out, and the foot will um, unbend on its own. Passively correctable feet are those that, with a little bit of manipulation, you can uh, stretch the foot and uh, get it to actually bend in the opposite direction a little bit. And then the rigid feet are the ones that uh, we are unable to straighten um, uh, with, man with uh, manipulation. And these will often have a deep fixed medial crease uh, in the middle of the foot. Uh, the treatment is based on the uh, uh, classification system. Those that are actively correctable, you don't have to do anything with. These will correct on their own. I just reassure the family and explain to them what the natural history is. Those that are passively correctable, they often will get better on their own as well. However, um, I'll uh, often get the parents involved and teach them how to do some stretching exercises, which are essentially just unbend the foot and make it straight um, so that they can uh, get involved in the treatment and it may actually uh, speed it up a little bit. And in some cases, I may use reverse slash shoes to maintain the correction for a couple of months, but very often nothing other than just the stretching. And then lastly, for the rigid feet, you really do have to do something. These don't get better on their own. Um, and uh, in that case, I will always start with um, four to six weeks of stretching at home by the parents. If that doesn't work, then I will switch over to casting. And these are casts that I'll place um, for one or two weeks. Then I'll re-manipulate the foot and place them back into a cast. And usually within a month or so, uh, the foot is corrected. Again, the goal is to get a straight lateral border. And then to maintain that correction, I'll then place them into a reverse last shoe. Calcaneo valgus foot is another very common um, foot deformity that is seen in newborns. We also believe this is due to intrauterine um, positioning. And uh, calcaneo valgus describes what the foot looks like. Now, of course, if you don't speak orthopedish, you may not uh, recognize that. Um, but essentially what it means is that the heel is the, it's the opposite of Aquinas. The heel is pointed down and the forefoot is um, uh, uh, up and out. So if you look at these uh, pictures here, you'll see that the um, uh, heel is down, the forefoot is up, plastered to the um, uh, anterior shin, and the hind foot is swung out to the side. This is the little toe, um, and the hind foot is in valgus alignment. Um, this deformity is usually supple, and again, it gets better on its own within about three months. Um, I reassure the parents of this. I explain to them what the situation is, and I will um, generally uh, teach them how to do strong home stretching exercises. And I tell them, just make it look like a foot. So you see the picture on the left, it's in, cal it's in the val uh, calcaneo valgus alignment. And then with some gentle manipulation, you make it look like a foot and they do that a few times a day, uh, every other diaper change and the foot responds very nicely. It's very important though, to differentiate a isolated calcaneo valgus foot from a foot with posteromedial bowing um, uh, of the tibia and associated shortening of the tibia. If you look closely, you'll notice that there's actually a deformity in the lower leg, and that corresponds nicely with this x-ray of the same patient, um, and that is posteromedial bowing. Um, the bowing typically gets better by itself by about five to seven years of age. However, the shortening does not, and that um, often will require surgery. Um, so I will often get, I will usually get an x-ray um, of um, most of the feet that present to me with um, calcaneo valgus um, malalignment. We'll move on to um, uh, flexible flat feet. Again, very common. Uh, and interestingly, typically asymptomatic, despite a lot of anxiety about flat feet and the horrors associated with them, they really are not a problem. It's quite standard in infants. Um, most infants have fat, um, uh, flat feet. Um, arch develops on its own with growth. 
Um, what's interesting is that up to 20% of adults have flat feet and the vast majority of them, and I should say us, I have a flat foot, are asymptomatic and have no troubles whatsoever. The natural history I mentioned is that it's present in all infants. The arch appears at about three to four years of age and the arch develops with growth. And we think this happens for three reasons. One is they simply lose the subcutaneous fat that was hiding uh, the arch. Um, there's also an increase in uh, muscle strength that helps to support the, um, uh, the foot. And then uh, lastly, there is a reduction in ligamentous laxity. A lot of kids are very flexible. We know they can get their toes to their mouth. And as they get older, they lose some of that flexibility and um, their arch develops. Um, a man named Lynn Stahely uh, did a terrific study uh, many years ago and looked at 880 people um, and looked at the difference, but the ratio between their mid, <coughs> mid foot width and hind foot width. And they found, he found this, this um, uh, arc of um, uh, arch development where babies are flat and then children and adults um, will have an arch. And as adults get older, um, they often will lose that arch just um, through uh, wear and tear and gravity but it is not pathological. The uh, exam that I'll perform always is I'll watch them walk and then I'll get them to stand up on their toes. So here you see a picture of a child from behind. You'll see they have too many toes sticking out from the feet, indicative of a, a flat foot, but when, and their hind foot is in valgus. When they stand up on their toes, the hind foot corrects into varus and they actually reconstitute an arch very nicely. On the tabletop, I'll examine their hips. I'll um, look for any rotational malalignment within the tibia. I assess them for joint laxity, check their Achilles tendon, look for foot callosities. And I'll also look at their sneakers um, to see how they're wearing. And it's not unusual that instead of wearing on the outside, as many people do, they really excessively wear on the inside of their shoes. Treatment is dependent upon whether or not they have pain. A, uh, a painless, flexible, flat foot really does not require any treatment whatsoever. Um, you could certainly put an insert in and it will change the shape of the foot while they're wearing the insert, while they're stepping on the insert, but it does not lead to the permanent creation of an arch. And um, a great study was done in 1989 where they took a whole bunch of children and they got x-rays of their flat feet and the x-ray demonstrated that the foot in, flat, in fact was flat. They then gave them an insert and they took an x-ray with the insert and they had a nice arch. Eight years later, they came back and took an x-ray with the insert and they had a nice arch. Then they removed the insert, took another x-ray and they all collapsed. Thankfully, we will never have to do that study again and subject children to that much radiation but it proved that you don't create a permanent arch with a shoe insert and there's no value to it. If they're having pain on the other hand, then an orthotic or a shoe insert um, can be helpful. And uh, I certainly have no, in, no inhibitions to recommending <clears throat> a, um, uh, an insert for a child with a, a painful, uh, flexible flat foot. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I always assess the Achilles tendon because sometimes the Achilles tendon can be the culprit, in which case some stretching, casting, and rarely surgical lengthening of the tendon um, may help with pain. Last thing we'll talk about is club foot. And I mentioned um, calcaneo valgus. The foot is, the, the heel is pointed down and the hind foot is pointed to the um, uh, lateral side or the outside. A, a club foot is the opposite. And this is talipes equinovarus is the, uh, orthopedish name, tail is his ankle, pez his foot, and equine uh, is a horse that describes the heel. The heel is, is pulled upwards and um, the rest of the foot is bent inwards, equine ovaris. And the um, etiologies can be idiopathic. That is, we just don't know what causes it. Sometimes it's postural and it's quite supple from just intrauterine um, positioning. And then they can be associated with neurological conditions as well as syndromes. For the purpose of this talk, we're gonna really just talk about idiopathic club feet. There is a racial predilection. It's seen about one out of a thousand in um, white children, um, less, frequency, less frequently in Japanese children. In black South Africans, there was a study done and it was found with higher frequency. 
and um, much higher frequency um, in children from Polynesia. It's seen also a bit more commonly in boys than girls, and about half the time it's bilaterally. We have really no idea why it occurs. People are looking now at genetics. There have been a couple of genes that have been found to be associated with clubfoot, but none that are uniformly associated with clubfoot. It is very important to do a careful birth history as well as a family history um, to, make, to try and uh, uh, ascertain whether there might be some underlying genetic syndromic or neurologic um, uh, cause. Always examine the neck for torticollis. I look at the spine carefully for any evidence of dysraphism. Check the hips for instability. What you'll always note with club foot is that there's a little bit of uh, calf thinning um, and the foot is often smaller. Now, of course, that's only gonna be noted if it's uh, unilateral. When it's bilateral, you don't really appreciate it. The mnemonic to remember the um, uh, uh, deformity is cave, and that is uh, midfoot cavus, forefoot adductus, hindfoot varus, and hindfoot equinus. And that is the definition of a club foot. X-rays are not really at all helpful in either diagnosing or guiding treatment. I do see, however, a lot of ultrasounds once or twice a week. I'll see a prenatal ultrasound uh, for consultation of a fetus with um, uh, a club foot. And we go over the um, uh, same discussion that we're having now, frankly, about uh, causes of club foot and treatment. And they, the parents generally find that quite reassuring. If you don't do anything for club foot, the deformity worsens. They'll develop um, uh, calluses on the top of their foot where, they will, where they'll be walking. And it can be very difficult to wear a shoe and they need real modifications. These are just three children that I've come across during my international um, travels. In the United States, you really don't see any untreated club foot, thankfully. The goal of treatment is to create a functional pain-free plantigrade and supple foot. That is a foot that with a, is planted firmly on the ground with the toes pointed straight ahead and is um, uh, flexible and painless. It's important to recognize that a club foot will never be a normal foot. We can make them very, very good feet. But as I mentioned earlier, they'll be a little bit smaller than the non-club foot. The calf is a bit thinner and they'll usually be just a touch um, uh, stiffer than the non-club foot. However, there is nothing they can't do. And over my 20 years, I now have uh, college athletes and kids that are highly competitive in, in high school and club sports. The treatment of choice over the last 20 years has evolved to be the Ponsetti method. This is a picture of Ignacio Ponsetti, uh, who was a Spanish pediatric orthopedic surgeon who spent most of his career at the University of Iowa. And he really devoted his life to the understanding of um, club foot. And he developed this remarkable method for treatment that requires weekly serial castings. Uh, each week we manipulate the foot, make it a little bit straighter. And typically within uh, six to eight weeks, the uh, foot is corrected. We can correct almost <clears throat> the entire, we can correct the, just about the entire deformity uh, with casting, except for the Achilles tightness. And that does require a tiny procedure in the office where we just cut the um, uh, Achilles tendon that allows the heel to drop down. After the foot's corrected, the child will wear boots and bars for about four months full-time, followed by nights and naps until they're three to four years of age. So it is a real time commitment on the, point, on the part of the parents and they require a lot of attention. I'll see the children every four months while they're in their boots and bars to make certain that things are going well and to help uh, and reinforce and support the parents. The results are remarkable. There's been probably greater now than 90% decline um, in the operative treatment of club foot. Uh, certainly in the United States, um, there's no pediatric orthopedic center where they're doing um, uh, uh, surgical correction. Um, I have an organization now that is called Miracle Feet. We're in 28 countries with 243 clinics. And um, as of the writing of this slide, which was uh, uh, probably a couple of weeks ago, um, we had 47,000 children. We had our board meeting, board meeting last weekend, and we're now up to 50,000 children treated, um, all without um, surgery. The other, of course, big change of parental expectations, um, and that is the, uh, there are these tremendous uh, web uh, groups and support groups uh, where um, parents know better not to allow their children um, to have surgery any longer. So I'm gonna stop here, and I'm happy to address any questions um, that uh, the audience has. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Hyman. I think that's a really important point. And my uh, 
one of my mentors for club foot as well always said that they should call it club leg not club foot and then that is the better way to explain that it's the musculature it's the girth of the limb the length of the limb and the size of the foot will all be affected whether you know no, no matter how good a correction you get or how great the outcome is and so setting that expectation early is critical um critical for parents. Yeah, that's a very good point. I tell the parents when I meet them, especially when I meet them prenatally, that clubfoot's a terrible name. It's an ugly name and it's an inaccurate name. And uh, it unfortunately, it instills tremendous fear uh, in parents and we should figure out some nicer name for it. Um, one question uh, that I had for you, Dr. Hyman, because flexible flat foot is something that we see so often in our office. Can you explain to the group how you tell if a flex if a flat foot is flexible, and then what's the difference between a stiffer or more rigid one, and what considerations are there when you don't have a flat foot that's flexible? Yeah, great question. Um, so, as I mentioned, as I showed in the in the picture, the uh, the child standing up on their toes. When you have a flat foot, the hind foot swings out to the side, swings out in valgus, um, and if when they, when they stand up on their toes, it's supposed to swing into varus, come underneath their body. If that motion occurs, that's evidence of a flexible flat foot. Similarly, you can do it yourself. You can um, grab the, the heel in your hand and rock it from side to side. Um, and if it moves, that's movement through the subtalar joint. That's another indication of a flexible flat foot. If it doesn't move, then that's a rigid flat foot. And a rigid flat foot is associated with neurological conditions or bony structural problems, but that's a whole different animal and much less common than a flexible flat foot. Great, um, so we have a couple of questions to address both in the chat and in the Q and A. Um, on the topic of club foot, just to round that out, there's a technical question about the use of an 11 blade versus a 15 blade or a beaver blade or a needle for your percutaneous Achilles tenotomy. Coming from sure. Jerk, thanks so much. Um, so I uh, use a beaver blade in the office, which is a, um, it's an ophthalmologic blade. It's very, very small. It's a little bit rounded. Um, I, I don't use an 11 blade. They, I don't like how sharp it is and also how, how much time it takes for it to get wide enough. Um, that means that I have to stick it deeper and I'm, I get a little bit worried about that. So I use a beaver blade. I know that some people will use a, um, an 18 gauge needle um, to cut the tendon. Um, I, have, I have access to a beaver blade, so I find that um, to work very well for me. Perfect. Um, we have another question about what you mean by nights and naps, the terminology sure. for, for boots and bars. So nights and naps, I guess, is just a cute way of saying when the child is asleep. Um, the uh, use of the boots and bars is critical to the maintenance of the correction. If you don't use boots and bars, the feet will all go back to where they were. Um, and uh, using them uh, just when the child is asleep is sufficient to maintain the correction. And you're not interfering with their activities at all. So using it for when they're sleeping during the day if they nap, and certainly when they're asleep during the nighttime. Those of the, those parents who um, so unfortunately have children that don't nap, um, that's okay because on the other hand, they do tend to sleep a little bit longer at night and there's no evidence that um, there's a difference in outcome. Great, so we just have two more quick ones uh, before we have to move on. Um, can untreated flat foot lead to pain later in life? Yeah, that's a good question. Hard to say. Um, there certainly is no epidemic um, of um, painful flat feet. On the other hand, many people do complain as they get older of their feet hurting. Now, there is an issue within women, um, and uh, my foot and ankle colleagues can speak much better to this, but um, the tibialis posterior tendon, which is a very important structure uh, to help maintain the arch, um, in women, not entirely sure why, um, they tend to be a little bit more prone to um, uh, developing a flat foot as they age. But that doesn't mean that they had a flat foot when they were younger. Um, that there's a difference between an adult acquired flat foot and a uh, lifelong flexible flat foot. In general, painless flexible flat feet in children will remain painless flexible flat feet in adulthood. Great, and then we just have one other question. It's a little bit off of what the, some of the topics we've discussed, 
Do you treat any teenagers with uh, Freiberg's infarction or avascular necrosis of the metatarsals or other avascular necrosis symptoms? I know that you mentioned Seaver's disease and we see Kohler's disease as well. Yeah, so just very quickly, uh, most of those um, uh, a, uh, uh, osteochondroses uh, get better with time. Certainly Seaver's is, uh, gets better with time, nothing to worry about. Um, uh, Kohler's disease, um, uh, similarly, uh, that's, uh, that's an, an osteonecrosis of the navicular. That also typically gets better um, without any intervention. You mentioned an in interesting one, um, Freiburg, Freiburg's. Um, that often will get better on its own, but sometimes uh, the head, the metatarsal head doesn't heal and you're left with um, little bits of bone in the joint that can become painful. And in those very, very rare instances, you have to go in and sometimes debride the joint. And by rare, I'm saying I've seen it once um, while I was a, uh, in practice and I've never, I never saw it during my training. Perfect, well, thank you so much, Dr. Hyman. And uh, we'll move on now. We've been in the world of congenital problems that face the lower extremity. And now Dr. Lana Nierenstein of NYP Queens will delve into traumatic injury in the lower extremity. So Lana, please go ahead and share your screen and thanks so much for being here. Hey, thank you for inviting me. Um, okay, do you see that? Hello? Not just yet. Mm. How about now? Not yet. No, we don't see you yet. I'm sorry. Give me one second. There you are. All right, good. Do you hear me well? Yes. Okay, great. Okay. <laughs> so thanks for inviting me for this talk. Uh, for the next 10 minutes, I'm going to try to give you a very speedy rundown on pediatric lower extremity trauma. <clears throat> I see patients in New York Presbyterian Queens. Um, so we're going to cover femoral neck injuries, femoral shaft injuries, physeal injuries around the knee, proximal tibia, and distal femur, as well as uh, physeal injuries in the ankle. I'll touch briefly on toddler's fractures and tibial tubercle and spine fractures. So pedi pediatric hip fractures, um, they're pretty rare. They account for less than 1% of all peds fractures. They're very high energy, typically associated with uh, MVAs. If you identify a low energy uh, hip fracture, uh, you're, you should be on the lookout for any pathologic um, bone lesions. Um, complications can occur at a high rate because the child's osseous and vascular anat anatomy is unique and is prone to injury. These complications include a vascular necrosis, coxivera, uh, premature physeal closure of the proximal femur and non-unions. Our surgical fixation depends on the age of the patient, the fracture classification, and the displacement of the fracture. Um, and anatomic reduction and surgical stabilization is indicated most times uh, for hip fractures. Um, the person who's going to be evaluating the child needs to get a good HMP. They need to understand the description of the mechanism, whether there was a history of hip pain prior to the injury, a history of limping prior to the injury, and an adequate medical history. But if there is a, a high energy mechanism, then the primary evaluation will usually center around the airway management, <clears throat> cardiovascular stabilization and detection and ruling out of any injuries of the head, neck, thorax, abdomen, and pelvis. A workup will start with x-rays, uh, which will include an anterior, posterior, and a cross table lateral. Frog laterals are discouraged because it can further displace any fractures. Um, and surgeons typically appreciate full length orthogonal femur films as well. When do we order advanced imaging? Uh, if you don't see a, a hip fracture that's jumping out at you and you need more clarification, an MRI is a good idea. Plus if your history and physical is suggestive of a hip fracture, then go ahead and get the MRI. Um, or if you are suspicious for a pathologic fracture, um, any ABCs, UBCs like fibrous dysplasia or malignancies um, can be picked up with that imaging. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna move on to 
uh, femur fractures. Um, these are more common than hip fractures. Um, and these can be diagnosed with plain x-rays. You typically do not need to get any uh, MRIs. Falls are the most common injury mechanism for children who are younger than 10 years old. When a child is older than 10 years old, then you're anticipating a higher energy um, mechanism, such as, again, a motor vehicle accident. If the patient is under three, then you have to really be concerned for non-accidental trauma, especially if you identify a transverse fracture. Those have a high uh, coincidence with NAT, so be on the lookout for that. Femur fractures are managed in a number of ways. If the baby is under six months old, then a pavlic harness is prescribed. If a baby is older than six, but younger than four to five years old, then they are placed in a one, uh, one leg spica cast, um, which is typically applied um, either in the ER setting or the OR setting, depending on the institution. Operative management is, uh, uh, numerous. We have uh, several things that we can use for fixation of femur fractures. Flexible nails are used if it is a child who is under 50 kilograms or roughly 100 pounds, um, and if it is a length stable fracture. If it is not a length stable fracture or if the fracture occurs very close to the ends of the bone, uh, we say proximal or distal and orthopedish, um, then we use submuscular plating. Rigid nailing is used if the child is heavier than 100 pounds or 50 kilos. And again, if the fracture is very proximal or very distal. Um, an X-fix is uh, not used frequently, but there is a role for an X-fix in damage control orthopedics and polytrauma. Um, if there's an open fracture of the femur or if there are any associated vascular injuries that need to be uh, repaired prior to fixation of the bone. Next, we're gonna move on to physeal injuries of the distal femur. Um, you need an open physis for this. Um, so they cannot occur in adolescents who've already closed their physes. Um, sometimes they can be confused with collateral ligament injuries. Um, and these injuries occur from direct trauma to the knee. X-rays are sufficient for diagnosis, but MRI can be very useful in providing more information. The injury that we identify is a Salter Harris II fragment, um, which includes a fracture line that extends into the metaphysis. And the treatment is a long leg cast for four to six weeks if the fracture is non displaced. If the fracture is displaced, such as this one on the screen, then we will proceed with a closed possible open reduction and percutaneous fixation or internal fixation um, with screws uh, that are placed in an open method. Um, depending on if there uh, needs to be like an open approach done in the operating room. Um, unfortunately, grow, due to the anatomy of the distal femoral physis, uh, there is a very high risk for development of future growth arrest, and these do require long-term follow-up to rule out such growth arrests. Uh, pediatric tibial tubercle fractures are fairly common as well. Uh, they occur at the end of the growth, uh, uh, around the age of 12 to 15, typically more common in boys than girls. The diagnosis is again confirmed with x-rays of the knee. Uh, this, the, the reason this happens is interesting. Um, there are two ossification centers in the tibia. There is a proximal tibial ossification center, which is a primary one, and a secondary ossification center, which is the tibial tubercle. And the closure of the physis is asymmetric. So it proceeds from posterior to anterior and from proximal to distal. Uh, so uh, while the physis is closing, it leaves the tibial tubercle, uh, it leaves it at risk for fracture. There is a classification system that is typically well known. It's called the Ogden classification system. Um, and it uh, basically describes where the fracture occurs. Um, so non-operative is reserved for type ones and fractures that are minimally displaced after closed reductions. Uh, and they can be managed in uh, cylinder casts and extension for a few weeks. Um, and 
closed reduction versus open reduction and internal fixation is necessary for types two to four, uh, where you actually need to either, you know, take the child to the OR, close reduce it by either putting manual pressure on the tibial tubercle or open it up to sweep out the periosteum that's entrapped inside and um, fix it with a few screws. Uh, five is a sleeve avulsion from the tibial tubercle, so that will necessitate a soft tissue repair. The next uh, fracture to describe that we're going to touch upon is a pediatric tibial eminence or a tibial spine fracture. These are intraarticular fractures of the ACL footprint, uh, also seen um, with athletic activity uh, in children who are ages eight to 14. We start off with x-rays and MRI is very useful in identifying any ligament injuries or meniscal injuries. Treatment is based on the displacement again. So this classification system is known as the McKeever classification system. Um, and there are uh, four types, let's say. Uh, we're not gonna go into specifics, but types one and two, um, if you can get the tibial spine to close reduce nicely on x-rays, then those can be managed in, uh, in extension. Um, and operative fixation is again, necessary for types three or four. A type three McKeever uh, shows us that the tibial spine is completely avulsed. So that will necessitate either, either an arthroscopic or an open approach. A type four is an avulsed spine that's also comminuted. Toddler's fractures are unique to ambulatory infants and young children, typically kids who are, um, who just learned to walk and are, you know, tripping and falling a lot. Uh, a story that is basically pathognomonic for this injury is uh, a mom or a dad who go down the slide with their kid and the leg gets caught on the side of the slide and the, and the parent and um, they have a twisting injury or the tibia. And then after that, they limp or they refuse to walk. Uh, X-rays can sometimes demonstrate a line and uh, those can be if, if we don't see a line that they're diagnosed clinically, if we do see a fracture, then they're diagnosed on x-ray um, and the baby's treated with immobilization. If uh, there is uh, ortho available, then ortho will be consulted and uh, they will be splinted or placed into a long leg cast. If uh, it is a provider who's comfortable without referring to ortho, um, they can be placed in a cam boot versus a posterior leg splint. Pete's ankle fractures are the next topic. Um, these are very, um, this is a broad variety of fractures as well. Um, these are uh, com very, very common fractures uh, resulting from twisting injuries or direct trauma, also more common in boys. But I think that, you know, girls are very active in athletics now. And I certainly see, I think, a equal distribution between uh, males and females. Typical between ages of eight to 15 years of age, we start off with x-rays and CAT scans for fracture patterning and help with surgical planning. These ankle fractures can come in a variety of ways. There can be Salter-Harris-1 fractures, Salter-Harris-2, which again involves extension into the metaphysis, three, which is an extension into the epiphysis, um, or Salter-Harris-4. There are some special Salter-Harris-3 fractures that uh, we refer to as tillow fractures um, or medial malfractures, and there are special Salter Harris four fractures, which are triplane fractures. Those are um, managed in a special variety of ways. Um, typically, the management of of ankle fractures is uh, non-op if they are non-displaced. They can be managed with a cam boot or a short leg cast, depending on the fracture morphology or um, if the fracture is displaced and requires um, reduction, then typically that will be done um, in the OR. Again, closed possible open reduction and uh, fixation for displaced fractures. Fixation can be uh, placed percutaneously if uh, reduction is achieved that way, or it can be done through an open approach. And that is... Uh, Thanks Hello. so much, Anna. Yeah. Um, so one question that I have, and I feel like we, we see a lot of is mm -hmm. what is the right thing to do with a toddler's fracture? So uh, this is one of the injuries that often does present to people other than us first in orthopedics, whether it's a pediatrician, whether it's the emergency room, and there's some debate over how much immobilization is really needed for these. So where do you fall on that? Ah, um, 
So I think it's certainly easier for the parent, you know, if they come into the emergency room and they get a CAM boot and then they don't have to follow up for three, four weeks. Um, I think that's easier than coming into an orthopedist office. Um, however, I do find that a lot of parents require reassurance and they are more than happy to make the trip in to see me one week after their initial trip to the emergency room. Um, immobilization wise, you know, I hedge on being, um, I think I'm probably conservative with them in the sense that I do like things casted, especially if um, I don't know what they're coming in for to the emergency room. If there isn't a cold fracture, I do air, uh, air on the side of more mobilization and I prefer long leg casts on mine. Um, and then when they come in, if there's still nothing there, you know, I'll take off the cast, I'll examine the patient myself and then I'll make the judgment uh, in my office. I think it's a really, I think it's a really good point that a lot of it depends on what the family and what the kid is comfortable with. And I agree with you that I often will tailor my immobilization to the level of comfort of the kid and the parents themselves. Some of these kids come in and are already walking on this and you see the same x-ray as a kid who's been refusing to bear weight mm -hmm. for several days. And so you can sort of dose your immobilization strategy based on that. So I think that's a really good point. Um, we have a question from the audience. Is it okay for toddlers to jump on trampolines? I know what I would say, but I don't I know what I would say too. Nancy, what would you say? Um, so this is do as I say, don't do as I do. I have a trampoline at home for my kids. Um, I was, that's my husband's um, position, but you know, I, uh, so, so there are some formal uh, statements about trampolines. And I, I think that if you can be safe while using them, if you limit it to one child in the trampoline at a time, and if you are supervising the children, and if you know there, there are no other items in the trampoline with, with them at the same time. Um, the reason we as a family have decided we're comfortable with it is because our children um, are very uh, involved in sports and they're in a lot of gymnastics type activities and they use them um, in their practices. So we, we basically know what our children are comfortable with, but I uh, would strongly discourage anybody from allowing more than one child into the trampoline at a, at a time. Um, but that's it. I, I hope nobody will ever hold that against me. It's recorded in perpetuity. I know, so it's, it's totally in history. Fun. Um, I think we'll do one more question. I think we have a lot of physical therapists in the audience and you, I know you went through a large variety of traumatic conditions. Which conditions need physical therapy in a child? A lot of times we say that kids can kind of heal things on their own and basically as soon as we let them loose, they're back. Mm -hmm. Which types of injuries do you think really benefit from PT once uh, the initial recovery period is passed? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think anything, anytime when you're locking up a knee and extension, you're going to end up sending the child for PT, even if they are on the younger side. Um, certainly, you know, in my experience, um, if I've treated uh, a tibial tubercle closed in that, you know, age group where they're not, they don't rebound that quickly. Um, after a few weeks, I'll take them out of the cylinder cast and they will have a lot of stiffness and I will send to physical therapy um, at least for a few times just to make sure that they are uh, working with a therapist to achieve uh, near, near normal uh, knee range of motion. Great, thank you so much, Lana. Um, you yeah. can stop sc sharing your screen sure. and Thanks. we'll get our next speaker going. So next up we have Dr. Lauren Redler who is trained both in pediatric orthopedics, but with a special interest and a separate fellowship plus in uh, sports in injuries. And she will go ahead and go over some common sports pathologies that befall the pediatric patient. So thanks so much for being here, Lauren. I'm just getting this pulled up. All right. Well, thanks so much for having me and great talk so far. It's have acts to follow. So as Dr. Rosemont mentioned, I'm a pediatric sports medicine surgeon and so I'm tasked with talking about sports pathologies for the lower extremity. I'm here in my disclosures, which are not relevant to this talk. So I'm going to talk about four main things that I think a lot of you probably will have seen in your offices, um, but common knee injuries in pediatric athletes include most commonly overuse injuries. And these are the you know many common things that you will see in your office, like last good slaughter, which is probably a little bit less well-known in Seavers. I just saw two of those in my office today. 
um, ankle sprains, which are probably the other most common injury in all athletes. And then um, some maybe less common injuries that may present to your office, but two of the most common things that I see and operate on are pediatric ACL injuries and patellar instability. So overuse injuries um, are in particular, there are some special ones that are specific to the growth, growing athlete, and they tend to happen at periods of growth spurt. So just like some of those fractures that Dr. Nguyen was talking about, that have um, specific timing in relation to timing of uh, growth plate closure. Um, these injuries also happen in, in periods of rapid growth. And so when kids grow quickly and their limbs get longer very rapidly, right, as their femur gets really long, their quad muscle by definition gets tight. As their tibia gets really long, their, cat, their gastroc or calf muscle by definition gets very tight. And when those tight muscles pull on growth plates, on crises, and these can be around the patella, on the tibial tubercle, which Dr. Nguyen was just showing fractures of, or on the calcaneus. These um, present with very typical pain syndromes from overuse. So the most common ones are Osgood, Schlatter, and Sindelar, and Johansson, which is a mouthful, so we just abbreviate it SLJ. Again, this happens during a growth spurt and due to tight quads. SLJ happens to be in a slightly younger patient population, so the average age is 10 to 12 years old. And this is when the patient has pain around their patella or the inferior pole. And so on this picture here on the left, you can see the kind of red spot right here at the bottom of the patella. This is the same diagnosis that um, in an adult you would call patellar tendonitis or jumper's knee. So this is the pediatric version of that jumper's knee. In a slightly older patient population, you know, 12 to 14, as their tibial crisis is, you know, starting to close, but their apophysis, that secondary ossification center is still open, they tend to get pain at the, at the tibial tubercle. And if they have pretty severe acid slaughter, x-rays will tend to have fragmentation of that, acid, of that um, tibial tubercle and even loose bodies. And then on clinical exam, you'll notice a big bump. And that's often what makes patients come in. These are not dangerous conditions. I always tell patients these are not bad, dangerous, or scary. They're just annoying. And that we can treat them and reduce their um, you know, episodes of pain, but this is not going to increase the risk of other injuries. So one thing to be aware of is something called a patella sleeve fracture. So Cindic Larson Johansson usually doesn't present in the fitting of a trauma. It's, it's an overuse injury. So if a patient has a trauma and they have a big swollen knee and they're painful at that inferior pole patella, you just have to be aware of this other potential diagnosis, which is a sleeve fracture where x-rays might be normal, maybe a little bit of a flicker of a piece of bone that came off the bottom of the kneecap, but some pretty um, classic exam findings and imaging findings that show that it's actually a fracture and that those actually need surgery. So the treatment for both of these is conservative. Anti-inflammatories are the mainstay of treatment. I love having my patients do ice massage and I think this helps a lot more than just icing. So I tell patients to get these little paper Dixie cups, which I'm sure you guys are all very um, familiar with. And if you fill them about halfway with water and freeze it, then when you take it out of the freezer, you rip the top of the cup off, you've got an ice cube at the handle and you can take that ice cube and massage the area that is most painful, so the bottom of the kneecap or the top of the tibial tubercle, or as you'll see in the next slide, the calcaneus for feverous disease. And I find that that helps more than um, just icing. A toe pat strap, as you see in the picture on the right here, is just a compression strap around the patellar tendon. The idea being that kids have to use their quad muscle in everyday life. And if you're letting that tight quad pull on a painful growth plate, it's gonna hurt. So if you put this point of compression in, the quad can in theory pull from that point of compression, relatively resting um, that painful growth plate. So this works better for Oscar Schlatter rather than Cindy Glass and Johansson, but patients do get benefit with both. And then most importantly is stretching, stretching, stretching. No kid stretches ever enough. Um, and it's important that parents know that this, this disease process tends to wax and wane. So this is not a, I get it once and I'm done with it and it never comes back. You know, in, in January, the kid might be complaining of the right knee and then they're totally fine. And then all of a sudden in May, the left knee is bothering them. And then in September, it's both of them. So they tend to have this waxing and waning presentation and it can alternate sides and be bilateral as well. Um, and so it's nice for them to be able to expect, you know, the pain to come back and that they're not doing anything wrong. Seizures apophysitis is, this, is the same thing, but in the heel. So as the tibia gets longer, more quickly, the gastroc muscle gets tight. This pulls on that apophysis in the calcaneus or the ossification center. It causes inflammation of that growth plate. This typically happens in a similar age group, so 10 to 13 years old. Um, and I saw, as I said, a couple of these in my office today, they usually um, you know, have some kind of trauma that I think it was related to, I got stepped on during soccer, um, but, but you know, now that you asked me, I think I was you know, having some heel pain a few weeks ago, and then a couple months ago, it was the other heel. And on exam, they will have a very classic finding of a positive squeeze test. So if you squeeze the calcaneus, you know, just grabbing the heel, that will reproduce their pain. 
And then on the right, he's looking at silver skull test, and this is looking at um, gastroc tightness. So with the knee extended, you should be able to get the ankle dorsiflex slightly past neutral, you know, five or 10 degrees. And in a calcaneal apophysitis or Seavers patient, you may not even be able to get them to neutral because it hurts too much and their gastroc is too tight. With the knee flexed, in the second picture, you can see that the ankle is able to dorsiflex a little bit more and you should be able to get it to 30 or 40 degrees. And in the Seavers patient, you'll maybe only get it to be, you know, 10 or 15. And this is a very classic finding and a really helpful exam maneuver to show the patient and more importantly, the parent. So if you compare both sides, what's the nice thing with lower extremity injuries is we usually have a normal side to show the family um, that the range of motion is different and that if you can work on some flexibility and get it to match the other side, their symptoms should get a lot better. In addition to the same treatment options as we talked about for Osgood Schlotta, the other things that are helpful for Seavers are a little bit of a heel cup. So a good brand that I've had good success with is Tool, and these are cheap on Amazon. I tell patients that this is not an all the time thing. This is a rescue thing. So let's say they're playing soccer and they've been working on their stretching and doing their icing and taking anti-inflammatories and they have a particularly painful day. These can be really helpful to put in their soccer cleats for a temporary kind of pain relief. But if you leave them in all the time, it will exacerbate that calf tightness because it's lifting the heel a little bit. And then there are some patients that come and they're just miserable. They're limping, they can't even put weight on it. You need to put them on crutches. And those patients do benefit from a short period of immobilization in a boot. And I often give the patients a boot just to kind of have on hand. And when they have these exacerbations, maybe, you know, a couple of days in the boot, a week in the boot, 10 days just to help calm things down. Um, and then again, lots and lots of stretching. Moving on to the next most common um, injury that we see in pediatric athletes are ankle sprains. And I'm sure all of you guys have seen these in the office. So a picture on the left, that um, cartoon picture of an ankle is showing the kind of most common ligaments in the middle kind of anteriorly as well as laterally. Laterally, there are two main ligaments, the calcaneofibular ligament, so the CFL that goes from the distal fibula down to the calcaneus, and the anterior talofibular ligament that goes from the talus to the fibula. And these are the most commonly um, injured ligaments. This is a typical lateral ankle sprain. What this being pointed to in the anterior aspect of this ankle in this picture is the syndesmosis. And so that's the ligament that is actually three parts that connects the tibia to the fibula. And this is what we mean when we say patients have a high ankle sprain. What's not seen in this picture is the largest ligament in the ankle, the deltoid, which is on the medial side going from the tibia down to the foot. And this is an uncommonly injured ligament unless there's also an associated fracture. Usually ligament injuries do not need to be treated operatively. In this picture down here and below, you can see the grading. So grade one is just a little bit of a mild sprain, two is a partial tear, and three is a complete tear. For type three, um, those are the ones that are more likely to go into recurrent instability, and they may need a surgical procedure called a brostrum, which is a lateral ligament repair or reconstruction. But one and two do very well with physical therapy and a boot, anti-inflammatories and icing. The hardest thing for them to get back to sports in any of these patients is to get that proprioception back. So that balance and the, you know, brain's ability to know where the foot and ankle is in space without kind of, you know, thinking about it. The only one that's different is that syndesmosis injury. Knees typically do not do well with conservative management. So those, that's the one rare instance where we would recommend surgery. And the picture on the bottom right is um, showing what's called a tight rope. So this is syndesmotic fixation with a suture. Um, so it has a little bit of give because it is a joint and it's supposed to have some movement. So it's not rigid fixation with a screw, um, but it does uh, really well to get these athletes back to, back to sports. Moving on to one of the more common surgical problems I see in my office is pediatric ACL injuries. So these kids will tend to present with, you know, I was playing soccer. I tried to cut and, you know, pivot and, and dodge a defender. And I heard a pop and my knee immediately got really, really swollen. And now I feel like I can't really trust it. So that's a really classic description of an ACL injury. The other common kind of description that we hear from, from athletes is, I think there might've been a pop, but you know, it didn't get that swollen, but the next day it got a little bit swollen. And that tends to be more meniscal tears. So meniscus tears don't bleed as much as an ACL. So the swelling is lower and less and it happens the next day. Whereas ACL tears bleed a lot and then he gets very, very swollen very quickly. Even in young patients, we recommend doing an ACL reconstruction surgery, so making them a new ligament to help provide stability. And this is really to help prevent that irreparable damage to the cartilage, that smooth gliding surface on the end of the femur and the top of the tibia, as well as the meniscus, which is the cushioning um, cartilage. And there's been some really good studies over the years that showed that if you treat these kids conservatively, um, that they end up having really, really terrible meniscus and cartilage injuries that often can't even be fixed. 
operating on these patients, you know, as bad, as a bad and scary as surgery sounds, if you're, you know, eight or nine or 10 years old, um, does get athletes back to sports and that is their livelihood, right? They don't have a career yet and sports is, is a huge you know, part of their psychosocial um, well-being. So getting them back to those sports is, is a big deal and not telling patients, oh, we're not going to fix your ACL, but you can't play soccer ever again, I think it's much worse. So here are two pictures of two different uh, basketball teams. Um, the, the kids in these pictures are all the same age, so right they're on the same team. Really important to note that these kids in the front row are not the same um, you know, maturation level as these kids in the back row. And the treatment of these kids, if you know, number three in the front row on the girls team versus 12 gun they feel tear, they're going to get very different surgical procedures. And so we use a bone age, a left-hand x-ray to assess how much growth is remaining. This picture of the knee x-ray on the right shows how I would do a normal ACL reconstruction. So I would drill a tunnel through the femur and it would cross the spices on the lateral side and a tunnel through the tibia and it would cross the spices centrally. If a kid has a lot of growth remaining, this is not a good idea because I'm going to cause an iatrogenic spicule arrest. So for males, if they're 14 or over, they have a little bit of growth remaining, but not quite enough that this is going to be a problem. So you can go across the physis. And for females, this is 13. Any patient younger than that, we need to use a special technique with an aleotibial band or IT band that doesn't require any drilling of tunnels. And this is not as common of a procedure. And it's one of my favorite surgeries that I do. So I figured I'd show a little bit about how that's done. This was originally developed in Toronto at SickKids by a surgeon named David McIntosh and then kind of modified in its current form by my mentor at the Boston Children's Hospital, Lyle McKaylee and Ben Coker. And this is a picture schematic of what that looks like. So the iliotibial band, which is attached to the tibia here at Gertie's tubercle, is harvested and then wrapped up and around the femur and brought through the notch in the femur and attached to the tibia and that becomes a new ACL. This was initially designed as kind of a temporizing measure for these young athletes to get them to the age at which we can do a normal ACL reconstruction. And the surgeons that originally described it, you know, David McIntosh and Lyle McKaylee, and this is back in like the 70s, found that they actually didn't need to revise any of these and they had a very low retail rate. So it's a really, really great graft option. This is an exam of a little eight-year-old girl who I recently did an ACL reconstruction on, and this is what's called a Lachman. So you can really see how much instability is in this girl's knee. And she actually, unfortunately, had ACL tears on bilateral knees. And as she walked, her knee shifted like this, and she would fall all the time. So another reason to fix this is to make sure that they're not, you know, falling in at risk for other injuries because her knees would buckle and give way basically, you know, every couple of steps that she took. So here's a, a schematic and a picture of the surgery. So, so harvesting that IT band, which we can see right here on the lateral aspect of the knee. This is now it harvested, and then we're going to whip stitch it to make that kind of a tubularized graft. That graft then gets passed through the center of the knee through these arthroscopic cordials where our camera's in the knee looking at it, reaching behind the femur with this clamp right here and grabbing those sutures. And then that graft is passed through the knot. So this is the middle of the femur right here with the PCL on the right of the screen and there should be an ACL over here and it's just not there. And now you can see this IT bin coming through and I will tell you this looks very much like a normal ACL. After it's passed through, we put sutures here at the outside of the femur, so this recreates an extra articular or outside of the knee joint component. And then in extension, we fix it to the tibial periosteum. So there is no hardware in this type of surgery, no drilling, no tunnels. It's a very fast surgery that patients do awesome. Clinical outcomes, these are both in JBJF, which is one of our premier um, orthopedic journals. And these are both from that Boston Children's Group that looked at their experience back in 2005 and again, um, about 10 or 15 years later, and overall very low revision rate. So chances are that, you know, patients repair and need this done again, between four and 6%, which is about what we know our adult reconstructions um, go on to revision. So no, no different compared to normal adult reconstruction. And then I know we're running short on time. So the last thing I want to talk about is patellar instability, which is one of my other favorite procedures and things to take care of. Um, I will tell you this video on the left, this is not how you should tell your patients to reduce their patella. Um, if you just lift the heel and have the patient kind of passively extend their knee, the patella will just usually reduce on its own. In the schematic here on the right, this is kind of an axial view or a cross-section view of the femur. And the patella here um, coming out and slamming on that lateral side of the femur because the ligament medially is ruptured. That's the medial patellofemoral ligament of the MPFL. And when that patella comes out and it slams on the side of the femur, you get these really typical bone bruise patterns. And what is more important is that if this um, knocks off a big piece of bone and cartilage, even after a first dislocation, those kids require surgery because we want to put that cartilage back. 
So for that reason, even in a first-time dislocation, I get MRIs on these patients to make sure that there's not a loose body. Things to know about what are the, you know, what are the features that increase the recurrence rate? So patients always want to know, well, what are the chances this is going to happen again? Female patients have a significantly higher rate of recurrence than male patients. If you've had a prior instability episode, you're seven times more likely to have an additional episode. If you have open growth plates, you're at an increased risk. If you're ligamentously lax or double jointed, so this is a Dayton Horan score, which I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with. I do this in the office all the time. And when you check that thumb to form, patients are often shocked and had no idea that their thumb was that flexible. It's a really good visual as a way to tell and explain to patients that they're at an increased risk of, of you know, an instability event, shoulders that dislocate, patellas that dislocate, or ankle sprains. This is, you know, you know, contributions to all of those risk factors. And then trochlear dysplasia, an abnormal groove shape. If that kneecap is this V-shaped bone and it's supposed to be sitting in a groove that matches it, if that groove is a little bit flat or even domed or peaked, it's very hard to keep that kneecap stable in that groove. And so that significantly contributes to um, recurrent instability rates, and that with open growth plates are actually the two biggest contributions to increased recurrence rates. Another factor is patella alter, or a kneecap that rides a little bit high because the kneecap is never engaging in that groove. And then like Dr. Rosenwasser was talking about valgus or knock knee alignment, that adds a lateral vector. If you think about physics and the force that that quad is having on the patella, it sits to want to track laterally or dislocate laterally. So when a patient dislocates, we talked about chondral injury, and here's what it looks like arthroscopically. So this shiny white is normal cartilage, and this kind of darker gray area with the central red is a, is a big pothole of missing cartilage that the patient's body was trying to fill in with some scar tissue cartilage, but it's fibrocartilage. When we opened, this is the, the size of the defect that was left, and there was a huge floating piece of bone and cartilage that was a centimeter and a half, and you can see that this is a well, this was actually a recurrent instability event. So she had been beating up her cartilage for a while. So there's all these fissures, but there is still pretty good cartilage here. And so in these young patients, this girl was only 13, we do put it back. So holding it in place with the K-wire and then fixing it finally with screws. This patient ended up having a meniscus tear a couple years later. So I had the benefit of re-scoping her knee and this piece looked perfect. So kids are amazing and they're allowed, they're able to come back from you know bad cartilage injury like this, which unfortunately as adults, we don't have that kind of regenerative power. And then after that um, cartilage piece is put back in, we do a ligament reconstruction. So this is a medial patellofemoral ligament or MPFL, we like to abbreviate everything orthopedics, reconstruction. And the difference in pediatric patients, just like the ACL, is that you have to avoid that growth plate. There's a slightly different technique called a physeal sparing technique. We use x-ray in the operating room to make sure that the tract of our planned drill fixation for the femoral socket is parallel to that growth plate so that, that the, the screw that we use doesn't violate the growth plate. And an adult patient who doesn't have an open growth plate, this drilling on the medial side of the femur would actually come proximally and we would pull it through the lateral side and that's an easier way to pass the graft, but obviously you can't do that in a kid. Uh, and then the final thing to talk about for all of these um, injuries, but most importantly, the ACL and the, and the MCFL is return to play. So that's the number one question that I get in my office is when can I go back to sports? There's two components to this. There's the physical readiness, you know, did your ACL heal? Is your MPFL stable? Do you um, have confidence in this knee in terms of you're not worried this is gonna happen again? And then that kind of second part that, we were, that I was just mentioning is the psychological readiness and that fear that they're gonna get injured again. And I always tell patients that these two features never coincide and that psychological readiness of being afraid that this injury is gonna happen again, or I don't wanna go back to my sport because that's how I got injured before. Those never happen at the same time, and that psychological readiness very often is kind of delayed after the physical readiness. So I might examine an ACL reconstruction and say, your knee feels awesome, um, your strength is great, your balance is great, you can go back, and there are plenty of athletes that say, I'm not ready, and they won't tell you that way. Um, and so there's a great questionnaire that kind of gets at that fear component um, if they uh, might not quite be ready. We're actually developing a similar questionnaire for MPFL patients after ligament reconstruction for patella instability and non-operative treatment because one does not exist right now. Um, but that same fear component is, is present and is really important in determining an athlete's readiness to go back to sport. So some final take-home points, ACL tears and patellar instability are fairly common in adolescent athletes. We recommend reconstruction of both that we don't have irreparable damage to cartilage and meniscus in ACL tears and don't have chondral injury with recurrent instability and in, in patella femoral instability.
And there are some special considerations for surgical techniques to avoid growth rates in these young patients. Um, and that's to do what's called a fight-seal sparing technique. Thanks so much. Lauren, thanks very much. That's a terrific talk. Um, it's a <clears throat> very broad subject, and I think you covered it beautifully. Um, we have a couple of questions. First question comes from, I believe, an athletic trainer. And the question is, should an athletic trainer be cautious in performing a Lockman or draw test on middle school athletes when an ACL tear is suspected on the field? No, I don't think so. No Lockman or anterior draw test is going to displace a tibial spine fragment. Um, it's the injury that's going to do that. So you're not going to make a non-displaced fracture all of a sudden displaced fracture. And for an ACL tear itself, it's either torn or it's not. So no exam is going to make that any worse. So I think um, feel free to examine them. And that's the best way to be able to give the athlete and the family any guidance on kind of what you think is happening. And before that, you know, huge team arthrosis or the bleeding in the knee and all that swelling happens, that's the best chance that you're going to get to get a really good exam kind of right on the when it happens. Once it gets a little bit swollen and patients have a lot of guarding because of the pain, it's a little bit harder to get that exam and, you know, be able to tell a patient, here's what I think is happening. So, no, absolutely. Feel free to do it. Great. Good guidance. Um, and what about use of topical um, NSAIDs? Do you have any experience with it? Would you recommend it for some of these osteochondroses, Osgood Slaughter, yeah, Seavers, and so on? So so one of the most common ones is Voltaren, which um, often is actually over the counter now. So you don't even need a prescription. It's on the shelf of many pharmacies. Um, there is you know, some limited absorption of the anti-inflammatory medication. It's not certainly as good as taking oral, but there are plenty of patients that for whatever reason can't take oral and topical is their only option. And it's a great thing to augment treatment, but I wouldn't say that it's kind of good in isolation, but there's no harm in using it for, for sure. Terrific. Listen, thank you very, very much. We're going to keep moving. We're getting close to the end. Um, and I'd like to introduce our final speaker, Kristen Russo. Kristen, we had the great fortune of having as one of our fellows a number of years ago. Um, and she fortunately joined us in Brooklyn, and she now works with um, Dr. Sam Vanderveld uh, at Methodist Hospital. And Dr. Russo is going to talk to us about a really important topic um, and a very timely one. It's on everybody's minds these last few years, and rightly so, and that's bone health in children. Thank you so much, Dr. Hyman, for that introduction. So I'm um, going to try to sum up a lot of what was spoken about, and it's great to actually have my colleagues have given all of their talks because a lot of the uh, topics we will have already heard are going to be discussed uh, during the next 10 minutes. So I have no relevant disclosures. So we'll kind of divide things up into a couple of topics. So why this matters, maybe a little bit of a review from med school or from college, depending on uh, where you're at in your career. Talk a little bit about pathologies um, and specifically deficiency um, in pediatric bone health. Um, the controversy over screening and monitoring or whether maybe we shouldn't be doing it. And um, finally, talk about some preventative measures uh, and treatment and supplementation. And I'd say uh, even amongst all of us on this call, there's a lot of variation and probably among all of us on this webinar, there's a lot of uh, different opinions about this. So I look forward to you know, a lively discussion afterwards as well. So kind of the cast of characters for pediatric bone health, it's not only about um, calcium and vitamin D, there's lots of other minerals that also play kind of supporting roles here. But for the purposes of this talk, we'll really be focusing on the main players, which is really calcium and vitamin D. And probably by the end of this talk realize is more so about uh, vitamin D than anything else. So whenever I see a, a kind of cycle graph like this, it cringes and I think about the Krebs cycle or something that I was supposed to memorize um, in medical school that I don't remember anymore. Um, and this is another one of those, uh, those cycle uh, pictographs that you may remember about vitamin D and how it's made and where it's metabolized and it may freak you out. Um, so sorry about that. But so vitamin D is kind of a misnomer. It's not a vitamin at all. Um, it's a steroid hormone. Um, and just like all other hormones in the body, it basically signals the body to do other things. Um, and so vitamin D has lots of different things that it signals the body to do. We're going to talk a little bit um, or mostly about uh, the bone health um, side of it. But so it basically promotes calcium absorption within the gut. 
Um, it helps to maintain serum calcium and phosphate concentrations in order to get normal bone mineralization in the body. And you need it for bone growth and you need it for bone remodeling when pathology does happen. Osteoblasts and osteoclasts both use excess vitamin D in order to function. So um, just basically, you know, the breakdown of this um, little pictograph is that either you uh, get vitamin D from UV rays from the sun, or you ingest it. Um, and both of those ways it passes into your circulation and then has to go into the liver to get hydroxylated to um, its active form, um, or really it's intermediary form, I guess you should say. Um, and then it has another further stop um, in the kidney where it becomes its active form where it gets hydroxylated again. And that's really where you get your, your calcitriol that is used throughout the body. So it kind of mentioned these other roles that it has in the body. Um, and really it's probably just immeasurable at this point, all it does. And these are just kind of some of the main players plays a huge role in reduction of inflammation throughout the body. So it's tied to a lot of these um, disorders that you see on the right just by those properties in general. It helps to modulate cellular growth, neuromuscular and immune function, and also glucose metabolism. So it has a role even in diabetes. Um, there are different genes that encode proteins for cell differentiation um, and proliferation apoptosis that without vitamin D, they could not function. Um, and a lot of tissues have vitamin D receptors. Some of them are converting um, vitamin D to its active form as well. Um, and even this past year, we found that vitamin D was helpful in some aspects in COVID-19 treatment. So in terms of what we're seeing when we talk about pathology and deficiency, it's this cascade that kind of just cycles and cycles and really just doesn't end. So you're you start being vitamin D deficient, and then this results in less calcium absorption from your intestines. So then you end up being calcium deficient. And then this turns on another hormone, your parathyroid hormone, which wants to then increase calcium resorption in order to make up for the calcium deficiency. At the same time, you're losing a lot of phosphorus in your urine um, and kind of throwing off the whole cascade here uh, that you need for, um, for homeostasis of your um, vitamin D and calcium channels. You end up with decreased bone mineralization when um, the body can't get enough calcium from um, other sources. It goes to your bone, it steals from the bone. Um, when you're young, you end up with disorganized spicings because of this, um, and you end up with growth problems. And then ultimately, um, you can have osteomalacia or rickets. So signs of rickets, um, sometimes there's nothing. Sometimes children can be really irritable. Sometimes there's huge delays in gross motor development. Um, and sometimes you can have pain. Most likely you're gonna see these things in the office and you know, definitely as pediatricians, um, you, know, you might be the first ones to see this, but often we're the first ones to see this. And especially after this past year when there were less and less regular visits to pediatricians, um, we're seeing a lot more of these pathologies that we never thought we would see uh, because of that lack of regular kind of annual visits to the pediatrician. So just some clinical examples. So the x-rays on the top are what you might see in a severe case of rickets. And you can see the physes just look very irregular. Um, they have this kind of eaten appearance to them here and they're definitely widened. Um, the x-rays on the bottom are after treatment with vitamin D for rickets. And the pictures on the left um, just show some clinical um, pictures of rickets. And, you know, we like to say now that we don't see rickets in um, first world countries. That this is really a third world country disease and nobody gets nutritional rickets anymore. Um, and that might be the case. Um, but I think depending on where you practice, um, especially in New York with a lot of the different culture that we have here, you may end up seeing rickets more than you think. Um, there's, you know, been recent trends um, with, um, new moms not giving, who are not breastfeeding their babies, um, giving them goat's milk, um, which has really poor calcium and no vitamin D um, in it. Um, even among breastfeeding moms who are not supplementing with vitamin D, either through large amounts themselves or um, in their babies, you know, we're seeing this. Um, I've had arguments with pediatricians who say they don't tell um, breastfeeding moms to supplement because all babies end up on formula anyway, and that is fortified. And I don't really think that's the case. So, you know, just, just something to keep in mind. I always ask, even if they're not coming to see me um, for 
for any kind of bone health questions when I see a new baby, is mom breastfeeding and is she supplementing? Because you don't wanna have to see something like this happen in this country. So if we're not seeing nutritional rickets, but we're still seeing rickets, which does happen, you're more likely going to see one of these other kind of rickets that's listed here on this chart. And this is another one of those graphs that like makes me crazy with the up and down arrows. And it's something that you're probably never gonna memorize. And it's these days it's easily Googleable and it's fine. Um, but these are all of the different types of rickets that you might encounter um, along the way. And so how are you gonna encounter them? And they're really, you know, kind of interesting questions. So, this actually I'm gonna show here is a patient of mine um, who was actually seen by um, my one of my physical therapists who I'm sure is still on this call right now if he could hang out long enough. Um, and he was seeing this child um, because he was he had an abnormal gait, he had a wide base gait. And, you know, he gave me a call and he said, you know, I don't know that something seems wrong. He's three years old, his legs were really bowed. He's like, I think you should take a look at him. Um, you know, and I did, I had him come to the office. He had old x-rays, but it looked worse. So I got new x-rays and I saw this bowing and it's more exaggerated on the x-ray um, on the left leg than on, than on the right, but it was present bilaterally. And I said, you know, something just doesn't seem right. Um, and, you know, talk to mom, she breastfed, but she supplemented. And, um, you know, I sent him back to the pediatrician who worked him up and said that the lab told me the labs were normal, but then still something seemed wrong. And I ended up sending him to an an endocrinologist who did a full workup and he was found to have X-linked hypophosphatemic uh, vitamin D deficient rickets, um, which is very treatable um, and even more so in, in this kid because he actually has one of the genetic variations where he can take one of the new special drugs for it. Um, and so he's only about um, a little over a year into treatment, but he's already um, doing better. And so this is the way it's probably going to present, you know, to your office or you know, to your practice these days. It's not gonna be the, the severe nutritional rickets. It's gonna be some of these more um, gradual ones. So other orthopedic vitamin D uh, deficient issues that you might encounter. Um, and some of the, so the topics were already discussed amongst my colleagues tonight. So um, there's a study looking at um, skippies and it was found that 85% of these patients were vitamin D deficient. Um, and when they started supplementing, supplementing them with vitamin D, they saw that they healed at a faster rate. Um, in OCD lesions, um, specifically the study was about the knee. In more advanced lesions, say three and four lesions, over 75% of them were found to be vitamin um, D deficient. And so um, it was found that in the uh, more severe lesions, you're more likely to have vitamin D deficiency. So just kind of a nod to, if you have a one or a two lesion, maybe you should also just be supplementing so that you can you know, increase healing and it doesn't progress um, to this lesion as well, especially if you're treating them non-operatively. And then adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, um, in combination when you're treating it with bracing and straw therapy, um, the use of vitamin D supplementation has been shown to decrease curve progression. So only about 16% of curves progressed in this study versus 48% of that progressed when we're just given the placebo. So kind of anecdotally, we don't have a lot of good evidence yet, but you know, a lot of people say you could just give vitamin D for anything that comes into your office because it might help. Um, so growing pains, uh, you know, very common um, kind of do we, what can you do? You can, you know, do very little or kind of not do that much. So adding some supplementation is sometimes a nice thing that um, for parents to be able to do. Um, overuse injury is, you know, something that uh, Dr. Rudler touched upon as well. We're seeing these more and more as our children play um, more and more sports for more hours or single sport athletes and the rate of bone toner turnover and um, just apophysitis. Sometimes a little bit of calcium and vitamin D can also um, help kind of in that equation. And then um, back pain, we're seeing a lot of COVID back pain. Um, and this is another one of those kind of like nuisances where maybe just adding calcium and vitamin D is also going to help. So something that's kind of really difficult to, uh, to understand is what's normal. Um, and, and you know, when should I check or should I even bother checking? So calcium is a pretty easy one because it comes on a routine lab draw with any chemistry panel. You don't really have to think about it, um, but vitamin D does not. Um, and it's a send out lab almost everywhere. 
um, which means the cost increases. But you look at look at it, the test is actually about $12. Um, that's not the cost of the patient because it ends up not being the cost of the hospital or the laboratory facility. And sometimes these can run upwards of 150 bucks to the patient. Um, and especially if you don't have the right diagnosis code with it, sometimes um, these will not get covered by insurance. So the short answer among a lot of people on this call is don't check and just always assume that your patient is vitamin D deficient. About 70% of children in the US um, by multiple studies have been shown to be vitamin D deficient. And I bet if we checked after last year, it would be even high, higher than that. I mean, the long answer here is I would check if you have a concern for bone health pathology, like we kind of talked about before, there's something seems off to you. If you have an atypical fracture for the child's age or for their mechanism, there are these well-published graphs about when um, fractures should peak. And you know, as orthopedists, we kind of know when it should cluster around which age group. So if that doesn't happen, I think it's good to test the level. And if the mechanism just doesn't seem to fit the severity of the fracture, uh, if something you know is is operative and is um, shouldn't have been, um, I think it's a good idea to check. I've gotten to the habit in the OR of just checking the vitamin D on these patients where I think something is up. And if it's more than one fracture, whether it's typical or an atypical fracture in a 12 month period, I tend to check, even if it's a buccal fracture, um, I think in a 12 month period, that's kind of a hard stop for me. Um, and I do check these levels. So I kind of left that what is normal about vitamin D um, in the last side blank because it's a really kind of hot topic and um, heated debate amongst uh, the people who should really be agreeing on these things. So the American Academy of Pediatrics follows the global consensus recommendations for vitamin D. And they say that um, you're deficient if you're less than 12, you're insufficient if you're 12 through 20, and you're sufficient if you're over 20. The Pediatric Endocrine Society is basically the polar opposite of this. Um, and they say that you're sufficient only when you're above 50. Um, and they're saying that you're still deficient if you are below 37 and a half. So this is widely opposite um, the American Academy of Pediatrics. So it would be great if um, pediatric orthopedics somehow fell in the middle of this, but unfortunately we don't even have any consensus recommendations uh, on what we should be looking for here. And so my thoughts are that it should be somewhere in the middle, but we're still working um, on, on coming to some real hard conclusions about this. So if you are suspecting that something is wrong, the next question is, well, what do I order? Um, because especially there's those multiple vitamin D tests and you don't really know and think you remember something about alphas or is it phosphate or phosphorus, and you don't really remember um, what is going on. So um, if, when in doubt, send to a pediatric endocrinologist, or when really in doubt, you can always just start off with calcium and 25 um, OH vitamin D. Um, and, and that will at least give you probably a good direction of places to go. Um, and if those come back normal and you're still worried, then you can either send them off to a specialist or you can order these additional labs as well. So we wanted to find out what our patient population, urban New York City population, both in uh, Brooklyn and um, up at the Children's Hospital, kind of what they knew and what their education level was about calcium and vitamin D and bone health in general, because that's the most important part. This is who we're treating and we can talk to we're blue in the face here, but if we're not reaching them and changing their practices, then you know we're really not doing our jobs. So this is just a couple of the questions that we asked them that I thought were, um, were pertinent for this talk. So we asked, is vitamin D found in the following items? And so the darker items are the ones that actually have vitamin D. And so it's great. Um, most people knew that vitamin D was found in sunlight. And then the easy one, like milk, people knew. Um, but only you know about half people knew that vitamin D was found in eggs. Um, and even less knew that it was found in fatty fish and salmon. And this is like the number one source for getting it from your diet, really. Um, so we have a lot of work to do. Um, in terms of, you know, of where to, to get it from. And then we also asked the same thing about calcium. And again, so the darker ones are the ones that actually have calcium and the obvious ones, milk and yogurt, everyone rated very high, but these are also really great source of calcium here. And 
people really did not know that. So um, it's important that we educate our patients about this because they, they're missing the mark kind of on um, some easy ways to increase calcium and vitamin D in their diet. So we talked about um, reaching people. And so I wanted to make this kind of infographic to reach them a little bit more. So we had magnets made um, that we can give out and uh, actually even use them in my daughter's school when they were learning about nutrition and stuff um, and gotten feedback from the parents there, which is really nice. Um, and I've heard that um, the kids really like putting it on the fridge and pointing to the things that they're eating and that they really understand it. It also has a nice reference guide where it has the vitamin D and calcium that kids should be getting every day, um, you know, for parents to read into a little bit more. So is nutrition enough? Um, and I would say with calcium, probably yes, nutrition can be enough. Besides dairy, there's lots of fortified foods now and more that make it easy if your you know, kid doesn't like dairy. But we really, really have to do a better job with educating about the sources from where this comes from. Um, because if it's that easy to get it through our diet, we just need to transmit that information better. In terms of vitamin D, I really don't think nutrition is enough. And I tell my patients all the time in the office, unless you eat like a bear, which is salmon three times a day, um, you're probably not getting a lot of vitamin D, uh, enough vitamin D in your diet. So I turn towards supplementation a lot. Um, and coming from experience with my own kids with having to supplement like iron when they were little, I remember that if it's easy and your doctor tells you exactly how to do it, then you will do it. If my pediatrician did not tell me which iron supplement to buy um, and how much to give, I'm a physician and I would have been lost. So we need to make it easy for parents. So you need to give them options. Also because they're children, they may not like the orange chewy vitamin that you have, or the sister may like that one and the brother may like the chocolate chew, um, or both of them may really be into gummies this month and it may change the next month. So giving them options really just opens things up. Um, so I have this sheet that I give out. Um, all of these products are also easily accessible. They're all available on Amazon, depending on how you feel about that lately, I'm sorry, but that's accessible to parents um, and they're safe. So um, they're safe in the way that you can dose easily and you don't have to worry about overdosing on things. So what do, you, what do I tell parents? Because these little graphs on the side about how much you need can get a little bit crazy too. I typically tell parents that they kids should take a thousand milligrams of calcium and 500 units of vitamin D a day. And that kind of gets all necessary evils out of the way. And if the child is older or if the child happens to be large, you can double the dose or even triple the dose if you need to. And this is for a healthy child. So this is for a child that doesn't have any fractures, that maybe has like an overuse injury or is coming to you with back pain or parents just wanna talk about bone health. So this is easy maintenance dosing um, that you should be using without any pathology present. So if you're just doing maintenance and preventive dosing, you don't need to check or monitor this. Um, you don't need to repeat labs or anything like that if you find out it's deficient. Um, but if you are doing a treatment dosing, I would check three months after initiating therapy. And I didn't really go into treatment dosing um, because it's complicated and um, probably isn't gonna happen in, um, you know, in your office. Um, but I would check three months afterwards and I would switch to a maintenance dose if it normalizes. And if it remains low, I would consider an endocrine consult at that time. So in summary, um, your patient is most likely deficient in vitamin D. You should, um, or we should all get better at educating about nutrition and supplementation. And it really should be simple and accessible to our patients. And it can really help prevent some of the common pathologies just with a little bit of maintenance. And I hope that one day soon, um, the pediatric orthopedists and the pediatricians and the pediatric endocrinologists can come together about a consensus for pediatric bone health. So thank you um, again. It was great to be a part of this and I hope that I um, summed up um, our talks today. Thanks so much, Kristen. Um, I do think that was a great way to end it and is very unifying concept to all of the different pathologies that all of us take care of. Um, so thanks so much for that excellent overview. We do have a couple of questions um, from the Q&A. Some are sort of clustered around some of your final slides, but what age do you start supplementation? Is it all the way from birth or what? at what time do you think that you should start uh, supplementing? <laughs> 
So um, like I said, if patients are um, breastfed, then I do start from birth. Um, so you can either give your baby, um, the recommendation is 400, um, or you can supplement as a mom, but you have to take um, about uh, 2000 um, units yourself of vitamin D a day in order to get enough to your baby. So if you don't want that pressure, you can just give them the drops. And then I do continue, um, no surprise, my kids, um, maybe not every day, but as much as I can get them to take, um, take a supplement. Um, and I do recommend um, just continuing it, yes. Great, we had a request um, perhaps to uh, repeat the calcium and vitamin D doses that you recommended later in your slides. Sure, so I again, try to keep it simple, a thousand of calcium and 500 of vitamin D. Um, and that's easy to remember. And it's most of those supplements that I recommend are like either right at that or they're like a hundred up or a hundred down. Um, and so the kid is also still eating, of course. So they're getting some source of this. So, um, so it's nice to, to just keep those numbers really simple for everyone. Great. And then, um, we can, Karen, we can discuss with uh, Dr. Russo about perhaps seeing a, there's a request for a copy of your uh, vitamin dosing sheet, as well as your recommended popular supplements that, that work well for kids or ones that you've sort of found have been effective. So we can try to get some of that, um, those materials out to our group. Um, Dr. Russo, do you also recommend um, giving potassium? Think. Is that Susan's question? Um, I don't, um, and I'll be honest, I don't have a lot of information. Okay. Yeah, I don't have a lot of information about um, the other supplements, yeah. So I know you sort of alluded to it at the end and uh, this can be our last question, but can you go too far with this? Is there vitamin D toxicity? Sort of, can we really just give with a plum and not worry about it? So I'd like to tell parents that you may get some really expensive pee um, because if you don't need it, you will still, uh, you will just pee it out. Um, so that's, you know, pretty benign. Um, there's been the like numbered, maybe less than five reported cases of vitamin D toxicity. And they've been from when um, either pharmacies have given an, like the wrong astronomical dose. Oftentimes in adults, these are dosed weekly, um, like 10,000 units. So it's been like the patient received 100,000 units instead of 10,000 units for weeks at a time. Or um, there was one case where it was actually the entire kind of bottle of pills was uh, the wrong dose. Um, but that that's it. I, I, there have been no documented cases um, of children being overdosed with vitamin D. All right, great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Russo. And thank you again to all of our panelists and to all of you for sticking with us. I'm sorry we ran a little bit over time, but we wanted to make sure we had an opportunity to hear all of your questions. So um, as a reminder, again, you guys will get a link uh, sometime in the next 24 hours about your CME credits for attending this webinar. And then we will also work with Christina regarding getting you some of our um, informational handouts, especially about Dr. Russo's last talk in terms of the specifics for vitamin D and calcium in children. But uh, thank you again to everybody and I hope you have a great night.